development. And the, uh, the it's it's at a relatively uh, introductory le level, which which I hope is is cool for folks. But um, ha happy to go in in depth with the uh, with the questions. So, uh, uh, in terms of disclosures, uh, I, I'm an employee of uh, Conexa Health, uh, uh, Chief Medical Officer. Uh, Conexa is a digital biomarker co company. We we build digital biomarkers and and implement them in in clinical trials, uh, mostly in the pharma and biotech se sectors. Uh, I'm also uh, an editor in chief of the the editor in chief of Clinical and Translational Science, which is a, a translational journal, and on the executive committee of the the uh, FNIH's Biomarker uh, Consortium. Um, I also serve as consultant in various um, kinds of uh, capacities. And the reason I, I just disclosed this is uh, all of these things are a little bit of a lens for, for how I view the world, and and you should know that. So today what we'll do is we'll toggle through these, these topics, uh, talk a little bit about the value proposition of, of biomarkers and translational science, uh, some important general definitions, uh, a, a little bit more in depth on a mechanistic biomarker approach with with an application to dipeptidyl peptidase four inhibition uh, and and drug development thereof, and then some uh, a little bit of a deeper dive into uh, of some other kinds of biomarkers and translational approaches by by way of short vi vignettes, and then we'll 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 summarize. So. I, I think what one of the simplifying principles uh, about biomarkers is that we use them all the time. Uh, we we use them all the time in clinical practice. We use them all the time in in drug development. Uh, uh, biomarkers should be familiar to everybody in the in the audience in one way or or another. And I think sometimes we um, we, we we kind of confuse ourselves because we we call uh, the these kinds of measurements a special class uh, um, biomarkers, but really they're 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 used all the time. So everything from hemoglobin A one C to to blood pressure really a a, a maneuver uh, that that creates a measurement. Um, radiographic evidence of of tumor shrinkage the pictures of a chest x-ray but you usually this would be uh some uh fancier imaging modality like CT or, or MRI and HIV RNA re reduction and and the reason I selected all of these as examples not just because they're in clinical practice but they're all uh, actually also surrogate endpoints and surrogate endpoints, as we'll dig into a little bit deeper, are a special class of, of biomarkers that have uh, 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 evidence associated with them, which makes them useful for uh, substituting for, for endpoints in, in clinical trials, uh, especially in advanced clinical trials like, like phase three studies. So all of these, these measurements, all of these biomarkers can be used as the primary outcome in a phase three study of drugs for diabetes or blood pressure or cancer or, or HIV. We usually take it on faith that biomarkers are important in drug development and that they uh, accelerate and increase the, the efficiency of, of drug development. Uh, but but I did just want to give you a, a little bit of flavor of the the kinds of of evidence that's associated with with biomarkers being good for for drug development. Um, over here on the uh, on the left is uh, uh, results from a very simple study that that characterized um, using wet WebMD uh, approvals in different diseases that were associated with surrogate endpoints. Or efficient clinical endpoints, or or neither. Efficient clinical endpoints in this case are clinical endpoints that could uh, um, re result in information uh, in uh, four weeks or, or or so. And if you if you look at the list of this is a little out of date um, now, but if you look at the list, 
there's far more approvals of drugs if they're associated with a surrogate endpoint or an efficient clinical endpoint than those that don't have, have either. Um, that's a, a relatively intuitive point, but it's interesting to see it uh, quantitatively. Um, there's there's also the um, uh, there's there's also uh, on the on the right a more statistical approach, where where investigators lo looked at the approval of of candidates with biomarkers and without biomarkers, and determined the the uh, probability of success. And then the multiple um, uh, for for that increased probability of success with with, um, with with biomarkers, and you can see there's substantial variation uh, uh, across different kinds of of therapeutic areas. Uh, some don't have a, a big a effect, um, like in in CNS disorders, neuroscience disorders. That's probably because we don't have great biomarkers there. In other areas like cardiovascular, there's an enormous increase in, in the um, uh, probability of success with a biomarker versus with, without. And, um, the, um, and that's probably because we have really good biomarkers in cardiovascular disease. In addition, it's it's really important to point out that quality and operational excellence are absolutely critical in in implementing a translational science strategy. And it's uh, it's not good enough to say uh, I'm putting a biomarker in my clinical trial. Uh, the 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 quality of that biomarker and the operational excellence that associated with implementing it has to really be flawless. And the, the reason for, for that is uh, in the, these next couple of slides. So this slide is, uh, is a depiction of uh, a seminal paper by uh, Steve Paul, a, a very famous uh, scientist and, and uh, 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 pharmaceutical executive in the, in the field. And what they did was create a, a model that, that showed where the the really the the pinch points in drug development were, were. and one of the areas that had the, the 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 probability of technical success of phase two had really the biggest impact on uh, on overall drug development as uh, cap as uh, captured by uh, cost um, per per launch. So the biggest savings, the biggest impact on drug development was in that was in that phase two. And that's because if you screw that up, if if you don't have that phase two result that predicts phase three, you uh, are not going to prioritize the, the the drugs that work, and that results in huge opportunity costs for for drug developers. They're not focused on something that that really will work. We'll, we'll come back to that point in, in a little bit too. The, the other place where, where it's clear that operational excellence is, is important or some other uh, um, tangential evidence for that is if you, you look at the priority date for patents um, and the launch date for the, the, the drug uh, ver versus their ultimate market success. So the size of the balloon is the, um, is the market success uh, in measured in in dollars uh, of the 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 overall market, and the colors of the balloons are are different classes. But it's it's very interesting to to note that um, especially if you look here uh, for for DPP four in, inhibitors, the uh, citagliptin was by far not the first patent that was that that was uh, applied for. Uh, but it was the the first launch of a drug, and probably drove the the uh, um, the, the 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 higher market success versus uh, others of of uh, in that class, and and so it's it's very important to 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 remember that the the industry uh, competes largely on the basis of execution, and the better you execute a drug development program, the higher the chance that that, that program is going to be is going to be successful. So, so let's talk about some general biomarker uh, definitions. Uh, 
So, so I like to think about biomarkers as being a, a, a bit of a tower of Babel. And the, the, the problem with that is confusions in, in the language uh, uh, often result in problems for um, um, that uh, often result in problems uh, both in clinical practice and in, in drug development. It, it can um, confusions in, in, the, in the language can lead to the misinterpretation of evidence, misunderstanding of evidentiary requirements, all the way up to failures for clinical trials, uh, delays, and potential harm to, to patients. So I, I wanted to illustrate that with a, a, a question. It's a it's it's a little bit rhetorical for for a Zoom um, wet webinar, but do you know the difference between a surrogate endpoint and a surrogate marker? And I'll go to the next slide. Uh, um, th this is a depiction of the number of articles in PubMed. Uh, um, th this was through, I think, 2019. Um, and the, uh, there, the two columns, one represents surrogate endpoints, which you've already heard me emphasize, and one represents surrogate markers. It's actually the number two that, that represents surrogate marker. And the, the interesting point about that is that surrogate marker is actually meaningless in, in the, in the um, terminology for, for biomarkers. And if you think about it, linguistically, surrogate marker is basically saying marker, marker, or surrogate, surrogate. It's basically uh, um, a, meaningless, a meaningless term. And yet many, many thousands of people um, use that, that term that really doesn't track back to uh, an important, uh, any important uh, scientific underpinning. Uh, the the uh, NIH and the FDA uh, have re remedied this in, in part with a, an online book called uh, BEST, Biomarker, Biomarkers, Endpoints, and Other Tools Resource, the BEST re resource. And it's uh, it's not published in a in a book form. It's regularly updated on, on online, and uh, it, it's um, a, a very useful compendium of definitions for for biomarkers. Here's one of uh, the, the the most important definitions: the the definition of of a biomarker uh, in in general. A defined characteristic that is measured as an indicator of normal biologic processes, pathogenic processes, or response to an exposure or intervention, including therapeutic in interventions. So you can see that that is a, a really wide uh, uh, definition. And it's very deliberately wide because the, the territory of biomarkers really is across molecular, histologic, radiographic, all sorts of different uh, types of measurements are, are biomarkers. One of the most important ones that, that we'll talk about in the context of, of this uh, webinar is pharmacodynamic or response biomarkers. And that, that's a subtype of biomarker that's used to show that a biologic response has occurred in an individual who's been exposed to a medical product or an environmental agent. On the other end uh, of uh, the evidentiary spectrum are surrogate endpoints. And uh, a, um, a, a surrogate endpoint is, is a, a sort of the holy grail of a lot of biomarker re research. Uh, an endpoint, as you, you all know, is used in clinical trials to, um, a surrogate endpoint is used in clinical trials to substitute for a direct measure of how patients feels functions or survives. For, for regulators, the gold standard is feels, functions, or survives. Um, and a surrogate endpoint is, is, um, is an endpoint that substitutes for, for that. We'll go into an example um, in, in just a, a minute. It, a surrogate endpoint doesn't measure um, the, the clinical be benefit of primary interest in and of itself, but it's expected to predict that clinical benefit. And it needs an accumulation of, of evidence that can be based on epide epidemiologic, therapeutic, pathophysiologic, me mechanistic, 
and other sorts of scientific evidence. And from the FDA perspective, surrogate endpoints can be divided into validated, reasonably likely, and candidate um, sur surrogate endpoints, depending on the level of, of evidence that's associated with, with them. So as I suggested before, blood pressure is, is a surrogate endpoint. And uh, blood pressure is, uh, there's a, a, a large degree of, of evidence that links blood pressure um, and blood pressure lowering, lowering with cardiovascular benefits like uh, protection from cardiovascular events like cardiovascular death. And because of that uh, mountain of, of evidence, if you will, the, uh, uh, the, the FDA uses blood pressure measurements alone as, a, as the endpoint for a blood pressure study. So that that's that's an important distinction. So instead of 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 demanding cardiovascular death or cardiovascular events as the endpoint in new blood pressure lowering, the amount of evidence, the weight of evidence suggests that that blood pressure is is a surrogate endpoint for those cardiovascular outcomes. In fact, I, I directly liken it to a mountain, and there's there's a um, th there's different components in this mountain of of evidence, and it's important to understand, at, at least at a high level, some of the distinctions. So, uh, we often talk about validation and qualification of biomarkers. We often talk generically about validation of of biomarkers. But it's important to distinguish two types of validation of, of biomarkers. The first is analytical validation, which is all about the assay, the test, the measurement. It's, it's the performance characteristics of, of that test. And the, uh, a, a test um, can, be, um, uh, can be acceptable or, or not acceptable for particular uh, kinds of uses. Uh, depending on the analytical validation of that test. Clinical validation is, is linking the, um, that those test results with, with a, a clinical uh, endpoint of some kind. And it, it, uh, the, the idea is to accumulate evidence that associates something like blood pressure with something like cardiovascular mortality. Qualification is, is not validation. Qualification is a formal regulatory conclusion that within a, a certain context of use, a concept we'll get into in just a minute, um, that a biomarker can be used for a particular application like a surrogate endpoint for, for regulatory approvals. The, the overall process for, for qualifying a, a biomarker is to understand what the the need for that biomarker is, what the particular context of, of use. Context of use is really the question that the biomarker is addressing. For a surrogate endpoint, the question is, can the drug be approved for, for a particular in indication? And then the benefit and the risk need to be understood, particularly as it applies to, to the patient. So the, the evidence, what that means is that the, the evidence needs to be weighed uh, given the benefit and risk of, of applying a biomarker in a certain situation. If we're talking about a surrogate endpoint and gating an approval or lack of approval of a new therapeutic, if we're talking about the, the, uh, a new anti-hypercholesterolemia dr drug, the evidence um, for lowering LDL cholesterol has to be really good because hypercholesterolemia uh, is, is a disorder that, that many individuals suffer from, um, and, and therefore the risk of making a wrong decision is, is high. In, in certain rare diseases that don't have other therapeutic uh, uh, options, the benefit risk equation is different. And in that case, the benefit to the patient of, of a new therapy, e even if the evidence isn't perfect, uh, outweighs the, the, the risk of a, of a wrong decision. 
So I want to dive in a, a little bit more in a little bit more detail uh, to a, um, a mechanistic biomarker approach, and it can be super simple. So you can think of pathophysiology as step one through two through three that leads to a diseased outcome. And you can think of biomarkers as either substituting or being re related to those pathophysiology steps. In addition, you can have biomarkers that are unrelated to a disease outcome. In some cases, um, oh, sorry, unrelated to the, to the pathophysiology. In some cases, that, that means that they're not really good predictors of disease outcome. In others, they, they, they really are. For the purposes of drug development, it's really helpful to, to separate pharmacodynamic biomarkers into early target engagement biomarkers that measure how hard a, a, a particular drug is hitting a target or uh, late distal uh, that are related more to the, to the disease. They're both really crucial for, for use. Uh, um, and I can illustrate that with a, a, a little bit more of a real pathophysiologic cascade. So th this is the, the highly cartoonized pathophysiologic cascade for dipeptidyl peptidase 4. And the short story is that when you, you eat food, uh, you release a GLP-1 um, in, the, in the gut. Uh, sorry, you release GLP-1 um, in response to, to, the, to the meal bolus in the gut into the bloodstream. It's released as active GLP-1, and the enzyme DPP-4 uh, uh, rapidly inactivates GLP-1 to uh, uh, its inactive form. The active GLP-1 um, increases insulin and decreases glucagon, and the result is to decrease uh, glucose in the, in the body. The principle of, of uh, dipeptidyl-4 inhibitor, um, uh, it, uh, sorry, um, I'm getting ahead of myself. The, the principle of target engagement biomarkers and distal biomarkers is readily illustrated in this. So the enzyme inhibition of DPP-4 is a target engagement biomarker, and glucose is a, a disease-related biomarker that's much more closely associated with the disease of, of diabetes. So if one were developing a DPP-4 inhibitor, the, um, the target engagement biomarker is circulating DPP-4 inhibition, and a disease-related biomarker is, is glucose le levels. And in fact, at, at, at Merck, uh, we, uh, we, we use those biomarkers and we're able to do a study um, um, even using single doses that, that showed the, the activity of the, of the drug. And the, the important piece here is that we knew that the about 80% DPP-4 inhibition was associated with efficacy in preclinical models. So we knew that we were getting um, a... Um, um, the, the kind of performance in, in early human studies that would suggest that the drug would work. And then in a single-dose diabetic study uh, with an oral glucose challenge test, there was a decrease in, in glucose following that, that challenge that was uh, associated with, with that, that uh, doses that, that had 80% or more inhibition of DPP-4. That study just that single dose study uh, uh, provided a go no go decision, a go decision to phase two, um, and it also informed the phase two doses. In fact, the the modeling in this case was so good that the the doses could be absolutely predicted from from even this very rudimentary biomarker data. Um, I want to make one other uh, point about the, the mechanistic cascade and its relationship to, to biomarkers. There's, there's other uh, analytes in here in the middle of the cascade. It's not that they're not useful. There are other kinds of biomarker pathway modulation uh, biomarkers, and they can be very useful for fully understanding the, the, the mechanism of action of, of a drug, as was done with, with DPP-4. So a couple of sidebars that that I, I want to, um, to to illustrate here. The at the time the the time frame for 
a, a, a drug development program. This was the, uh, the, the, the early 2000 aughts was, was um, for um, the first dose in preclinical toxicity experiments to the first pivotal dose uh, a little over four years and then almost three years in, in, phase, in phase three. Th this program uh, was far faster than that. The, that. That early phase was, was uh, almost 50% decreased and uh, in part because uh, the, um, the lengthy phase 2A part of, of phase two was, was skipped over. Um, it's not the only thing that drove th this as a speedy program. There was a significant amount of pre-investment that also was triggered based on the, the early biomarker re results. So the overall program was, was very fast and it, and it helped the, this particular molecule be the first in, in class uh, in, in pharma. The, the other sidebar that, that uh, the other point I wanted to make is that uh, it's, it's quite common in, in biomarker work to, to not pre-specify what you think you're going to want to see, and um, I illustrate that by by, uh, by by saying that you can't play football without a goalpost. So you can have you can have no goalpost, you can have too low of a bar, you could have the wrong bar, or you could even have too high a bar for a biomarker effect. the The point is that it's very important to think about that ahead of time. And to be able to to use that that thinking and setting a, a predefined goal uh, in in making a, a decision, and part of the reason for that is a, a, a very interesting FDA white paper that's uh, it's only published on the FDA website. If you if you Google that phrase twenty two case studies uh, where phase two and phase three diverged, you'll you'll find that that paper. It's really great reading for understanding what can go wrong in drug development. And one of the things that went wrong um, most frequently is, is basically summarized in the statement, despite exciting biomarker evidence in phase two, in phase three trials, drug X failed. Um, sometimes it was because of the lack of a link between the phase two biomarker evidence and the phase three endpoint. In other cases, it's because uh, the the appropriate kinds of goals weren't weren't set. So I want to talk um, now in the remaining time uh, about some some vignettes and uh, j just to go through some of these 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 additional um, uh, kinds of of, um, of of studies. And I'm I'm running out of power, uh, so I'm going to plug something in here so hopefully everything will be <laughs> uh, we we won't lose we won't lose power completely here but um i i wanted to start out here with with a with a familiar example again we referred to this at the beginning of the webinar ldl cholesterol so uh there there really is literally a mountain of of epidemiologic evidence that supports the um, um, the use of LDL cholesterol as a surrogate endpoint. It's been critical in the approvals of um, a number of cholesterol lowering agents, including the more recent PCSK9 agents. There, there's also um, new innovations like, like home LDL testing for, for screening in trials or, or for uh, um, med medical practice. It's a tried and true bi biomarker and um, and yet there are still significant questions about the general generalizability. So uh, one of those questions is, uh, in general, the uh, LDL cholesterol has been used uh, across different kinds of, of uh, mechanisms for approval of hyper, hypo, um, uh, cholesterol lowering agents. But it was very interesting. There was a mechanism, um, CETP inhibition, in which there was profound LDL lowering, but there was no benefit to um, in in terms of a mortality decrease in in uh, um, hypercholesterolemic uh, patients. So there still are questions even about uh, um, a surrogate endpoint, a biomarker with with such advanced understanding as uh, as LDL cholesterol, and that's just an important point to 
to keep in mind. Another more recent tool uh, that has come to the fore in drug development is, is measurable residual disease. And that's been used as uh, both a prognostic biomarker and a surrogate endpoint in, in cancer studies. And the, the concept itself has a strong um, face validity along with, with evidentiary su support. Uh, the, the idea is that e even at levels that are uh, invisible to conventional laboratory tests, if there is still measurable residual disease after, after therapy, there, there could be re relapse. And uh, that's been borne out with um, 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 that, that the concept was originally important in approvals for AL, but it's been extended to AML and multiple myeloma and uh, monoclonal, monoclonal gamma, uh, gammopathy of undetermined significance. So it's, it's become a more generalized uh, co concept and a very important concept, both, uh, again, uh, for clinical practice and and uh, prog as a, as a prognostic biomarker and as a surrogate endpoint for for drug approvals. Um, an, another innovation in biomarkers that's happened uh, a little bit more more recently is the creation of multi-component biomarkers. So uh, LDL cholesterol and and measurable residual disease, are single biomarkers. The, the meaning of the biomarker is translated in the value of LDL cholesterol or the amount of measurable residual disease. The, the concept of a multi-component biomarker is, um, is gaining increasing use, but it's, a, um, uh, it's sometimes a single measurement that's derived from multiple other measurements. In, in this case, uh, there's, there's several non- uh, NASH has uh, been traditionally diagnosed with, with biopsies, and there's a real need for non-invasive measurements. And uh, the, the test that's depicted in this slide, ELF, um, Enhanced Liver Fibrosis Test, is a multi-component biomarker that combines measurements of three markers for a hepatic extracellular matrix. And it generates a, a numerical score that's depicted um, in the in the graph, which is which is really predictive of of um, the the proportion of of patients that progress to cirrhosis or other other liver events. So th that's a, a a very important development uh, both for for li liver disease, but but also for multi component uh, biomarkers. Um, another. Um, important use of translational science in drug development is, uh, is related to the, the concept of demonstrating substantial evidence of effectiveness. Um, and th this, is, um, uh, th this is a component of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act um, in which uh, one can have uh, one adequately controlled uh, clinical study with confirmatory evidence. It's very important to point out that that confirmatory evidence can take the form of, of important translational uh, um, evidence. So in this example, in, in Fabre disease, uh, which is caused by mutations of the, the GLA gene, there was an accelerated approval of Miglistat, um, and it was done on the basis of a surrogate endpoint in one clinical trial but also on the reduction of GL3 inclusions, uh, um, sorry, that was the surrogate endpoint, reductions in GL3 inclusions, but also uh, in conjunction with non-clinical laboratory mechanism of action evidence that, that um, uh, it was amenable to, to GLA gene variants. So that's in the center of, of this slide. So a very important use, and I don't think we always think of biomarkers as, as being important non-clinically as well as, as clinically. Um, the next slide shows another um, mechanistic use of, of, um, of biomarkers. And in this case, in support of, of drug labeling. So uh, one of the, um, what, when a drug is approved, 
a, a drug label is created in conjunction with, with regulators and it contains all of the important prescription evidence um, and really guides how the drug is, is used. In, in the case of, of a combination product of citagliptin, a DPP-4 inhibitor, and metformin, really important mechanistic information was, was included in the label that was derived directly from, from biomarker uh, evidence. And it was a bit of a mystery at the time why this combination worked as well as it, as it did. And it turned out that metformin was increasing the amount of total GLP-1, which uh, citagliptin then stabilized the active part of that. And it, it uh, was um, um, an additive effect on, on the decrease of, decrease of, of, uh, of glucose in, in diabetes. And then that concept went directly into the label of the combination product for citagliptin and metformin and is very helpful for, for, uh, for prescribers. Um, the, the, the other point I want to make is that biomarkers are, are moving into uh, other uh, arenas. Uh, biomarkers themselves are undergoing a significant amount of, of innovation. We've seen re real revolutions in biomarkers like uh, measurable residual disease, uh, different kinds of multi-omic me measurements, and even single-cell RNA-seq as, as a biomarker. At the same time, uh, digital biomarkers and digital health technologies are really starting to take off uh, in terms of, um, of biomarkers. And that's part of the business of, of Conexa Health, um, as I stated. What, one example is in functional status. And it, it's, it's an important example because conventional performance status is, a, um, is really a poor reflection of, of how patients are, are really um, functioning and, and performing. Many of you uh, who work in oncology may be familiar um, with, with a scale um, that goes from zero to five and measures essentially how dead you are. Zero meaning um, good health, five meaning dead. And it's used in, in, um, as an inclusion exclusion criteria in most studies of, um, uh, of oncology agents. And yet you can, you can readily see that, that it doesn't have a great discriminating uh, power that, there. But, but even a simple measure like uh, actigraphy, step counts, may, may be more, uh, may be associated uh, with, in, a, in a better way with, um, um, with, 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 dis with disease progression. And so we're, we're working on digital biomarkers li like this uh, especially combinations of these digital biomarkers to to um, to better predict uh, uh, poor responses in cancer uh, as well as 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 good responses in in cancer. So j just a couple more points he here. Um, I I would like to mention uh, that uh, translational clinical models are also a, a very important feature uh, of the, the the work that that the translational work that can help uh, drug development. So there are definitely circumstances where there is no biomarker that that measures what we want to to, to measure. There's no clinical outcome that measures what we what we want to measure. And in in those cases, there are sometimes pharmacologic or other perturbations that uh, that can provoke some kind of a measurable change that's uh, of, of use uh, to, um, uh, uh, to drug developers, regulators, and then ultimately to, to prescribers. For, for drugs that, that uh, affect uh, um, attention, including hypnotics, uh, there's always a worry about the, the performance with, with um, with, with large machines like like automobiles and whether driving performance will be will be decreased there's in general two ways to do this there's a driving simulator that that um, is um, on the on the top panel here or real on the road driving which is in that in that bottom panel um, re rest assured that real on the road driving is is a, a, a fully safe procedure. Uh, the person in the passenger seat is a is a trained uh, um, operator, 
and there's controls in the car on the passenger side and in this this modified car so if there ever were an issue it would be easy to take control of the of the car but the um the the kinds of 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 work that can be done with these kinds of translational models is to see whether there there is an, an effect on on that on that driving uh, one of the one of the measures that's often used is uh, the, the the standard deviation of of lane position. So you can think of it as as weaving, uh, if if you will. And in the case of um, an alerting agent that that Merck was developing, a, a histamine H three inverse agonist, uh, there was really no difference from the the effects of modafinil which which made the the company less eager to to develop the, that that drug that was in a simulated driving uh, situation and in the case of suvorexin which is an orexin antagonist there um at, at doses that were clinically used there were very little residual effects and and that became part of uh of labeling that was was very important for for the drug suvorexin, and then finally, in terms of of a of a um, of a vignette, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about some of the many other innovative uh, uh, approaches which uh, translational scientists are are using in drug development. They're 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 listed here, um, including. Um, a focus on patient centricity and precision medicine and real world data. Um, you you can you can read the list your, yourself. Um, but a, a, one other one other um, um, kind of of approach that I wanted to mention specifically is reverse translation. When we think of translational science, we mostly think of of discovering a, a target. Uh, a molecular target, developing therapeutic interventions of of that and tools to measure that, and then introducing it into patients. But there's another very important part of of translation, reverse translation, where you take evidence from patients and then let that inform the mechanism of a particular disease, which in turn lets us identify targets. And uh, a, a really terrific example of that was the discovery of PCSK9. Uh, mutations in PCSK9 were originally discovered, which lowered uh, cholesterol in, in, uh, in, in the folks that had those mutations, and they had better clinical uh, outcomes compared to, to peers. And that led directly to the, a better understanding of how PCSK9 uh, is involved in cholesterol metabolism and how inhibition of that of that enzyme can lead to a therapeutic approach. So with that, I just wanted to emphasize a couple of take home messages. Um, the um, biomarkers uh, are um, uh, they enable, accelerate, and increase the efficiency of drug development. It's very important in order to uh, um, to, to get the results that you want to get with translational science, to, to pay really strict attention to quality and operational excellence of that strategy. Context of use is critical for defining the, the evidence around a biomarker qualification and a mechanistic biomarker approach that includes both target engagement and disease-related biomarkers is ideal for driving uh, drug development decisions. And then finally, uh, there's a, a whole variety of different biomarker and translational strategies, the sky's the limit, um, that can be crucial for, for drug development. I, I do just want to, to end with uh, um, acknowledgements. The, I, I, I tend to, to work a, across what I like to think of as the .com, .edu, .gov, and .org continuum. And and folks that I've I've worked with in particular are are outlined in this in this slide with um, with, with great thanks to to them. So so with that, uh, let let me turn it back over to our moderators for the discussion. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Wagner. That was incredible. A uh, great a great overview. Uh, we have a lot of questions in the chat, so I'll start working through them. 
Um, so our, our first question is about the approval process for biomarkers and specifically whether or not they need to be approved as a surrogate endpoint for a particular indication by a regulatory agency such as FDA uh, before they can be used in the approval process for drugs in that same indication. Yeah, so that's a that's a terrific question because it actually highlights an important nu nuance. So, so biomarkers can be used for decision making um, without the blessing of of a regulator. Um, the The only evidentiary requirement is the evidence that that you deem appropriate to to make that decision. So, you're not going to make a decision based on poor evidence that associates a, a biomarker with the outcome that you you want. Um, so biomarkers that are used in phase one and sometimes in phase two, there's no obligation to to go over that with with a with, with a regulator. However, if you're going to make a decision about the the um, uh, wh whether the the uh, that biomarker can be a surrogate endpoint, then you do need a, um, a regulatory approval for that. It comes in many different forms. In in some cases, that that discussion can occur uh, within an IND, an investigational new drug application. That's uh, that's not public not knowledge. It's discussions that are private between a sponsor and uh, the FDA. In in that case, there's other situations where there's public consortia. And, and other folks that that work together with the FDA approving biomarkers for for more advanced cl claims, and that's called the biomarker qualification pathway. Um, so our next question uh, was a civic question about the difference uh, in uh, PTRS impact between traditional and digital biomarkers. Uh, across uh, the disease areas that you've mentioned, uh, such as cardiovascular disease and, and the CNS. Yeah, so 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 truthfully, uh, digital biomarkers haven't been around lo long enough for for us to understand um, if there is a difference. I I think of digital biomarkers as um, an extension of traditional biomarkers, that they should be subject to the same kinds of evidentiary standards, the same processes, analytical, clinical validation, qualification, if, if necessary. Um, the advantage uh, of, of a digital biomarker is, is often in the increased precision that you can get and the fact that it can be done, uh, the, the, um, it can be measured at, at home. So an example, that, that um, it, at Conexa is in is in Parkinson's disease, and we have we've made a uh, essentially a digital equivalent of the of the Parkinson's um, endpoint UPDRS uh, that can be administered at home. It's a combination of patient reported outcomes and digital me measurements of of movements. The the um, the the clinically approved UPDRS is administered by a physician and has things like one to four scales. Uh, you can measure things like tremor or supination pronation with much more accuracy with, with, uh, with, with a digital biomarker. Uh, so we have another question about balancing the risk of submitting a patent early versus holding off potentially getting scooped. That might be related to the, the comment you made about how there are a lot of DPP-4 inhibitors that sort of got started earlier, but didn't necessarily get the first approval. So if you have any comments on that. Yeah, I think that that um, the for for patenting uh, um, drug matter, there's there's um, th there is a need for speed and there's a need for for uh, making sure that your patent portfolio includes um, um, obvious related structures. So that, that speed for small molecules, at least, is, is super important because if, if um, um, the, the, the way the, the biopharmaceutical industry works, in, in, in my experience, is there's very rarely someone working all alone on something. 
<laughs> there's usually um, a bunch of people who have discovered something at a near at a similar time. So the faster you get to that that uh, patent, the uh, the the more likely you're not going to be um, scooped on the patent, which would be, uh, of course, devastating if if, uh, if someone beat you to a, a, a structure and patented something before you did because you were holding off for for competitive reasons. Yeah, I guess there's that saying that anything worth working on, multiple people who will be working on. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks for that. Um, so we have another question about who leads the development uh, and validation of biomarkers uh, at an institutional level. Is that mostly in an academic setting, companies, uh, disease associations, or the government? Yeah, it's it's all of the above, uh, re re really. Uh, but um, I the majority of biomarker validation work is is um at, at least partly driven by by uh, industry biopharmaceutical industry needs the reason why consortia like the biomarkers consortia work is because there's interest across all those different stakeholder groups and combining forces is usually better than than working um alone Actually, I, I have a personal question. It, it sort of relates to this one in a previous one. And wondering if there's any process for sort of communicating approved biomarkers across companies or across institutions, because you mentioned that sometimes this process occurs sort of confined within one company's or one institution's interactions with FDA. Yeah. What does that that process look like? Yeah. So if if there is something it, that is is um, is done through an IND. There's there's not a good uh, a process for for sharing that unless the company um, publishes it. The the biomarkers um, qualification pathway has a list on the, on the FDA website that it maintains of of biomarkers that have been approved through the qualification uh, pa pathway. The most of the time, the, though, in in practice. Uh, um, even companies that are highly competitive will end up publishing that biomarker and it'll be part of of a um of a of a big phase three clinical publication uh for for example uh in in my view it's always it's almost always much more important to 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 share biomarker data than, than it is to, to keep it private because it really needs to be applied more more widely exactly exactly Thank you. Um, so, okay, we have a, another question related to uh, sort of recent uh, Alzheimer drugs approval, drug approvals, and asking how the, the FDA decides whether a surrogate endpoint measure is appropriate to measure efficacy of a treatment. Um, for example, in this case, given that it is unknown whether the reduction in uh, uh, amyloid beta plaques is beneficial in the context of AD. And with the recent data uh, suggesting that it may be harmful for some individuals, how would companies or the FDA figure out better or more relevant endpoint measures that are still quantitative? Yeah, so so that's a that's a terrific but also loaded question. Um, the the um, the the um, it's um, it, it's a it's a very complicated uh, um, and partly. Um, uh, uh, subject to a variety of other stakeholder influence for the approval of a, of a drug. And uh, in the case of, of, um, of, of Alzheimer's, as, as outlined, uh, the, the FDA is also privy to information that the public isn't because they've received um, dossiers on, on other agents and they they may have been pri privy to to more evidence that li linked beta amyloid reduction um, to uh, good clinical endpoints than was vi visible outside the the FDA. I I'm not saying that's actually what what happened. I really don't know, <laughs> but um, yeah. but that is that is possible. Um, um, I I think the the um, the the other. Um, the, the other thing that can that, that can happen during the drug approval process is patient advocacy organizations intervening with the FDA uh, opining on the on the need. And we have seen 
other drug classes that have been approved based on on really very limited um, information, in in part because of of patient advocacy de demand. The, the the question about are there other better biomarkers that there? It's a really terrific one, and the the only answer to that is just <laughs> to keep uh, um, scientifically investigating and and looking for for those those additional. Uh, uh, biomarkers in, in Alzheimer's. Uh, again, we're, we're quite interested in, in at-home EEG at, at Conexa as a, as a possible digital biomarker for, for uh, 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 Alzheimer's progression and, and other, other neurologic diseases. Kind of as like a continuous monitoring system, or j uh, just um, you know li limited to to the to the nighttime, but much easier than going into the clinic for for EEG. Um, okay, so we're a couple minutes past the hour now. We do have a lot more questions, uh, but I could try and combine a few just so we're we're not here for too much longer. Um, there were a couple questions about using sort of omics-driven uh, readouts, particularly uh, uh, looking at genomic-based uh, uh, biomarkers, so non-coding RNAs um, and other nucleic acid-based readouts and what your general thoughts are on the sort of validity or potential promise of those, those modalities as potential biomarkers. Yeah. So, so when, when you, when you look at, at clinical validation of, of a biomarker, uh, there's, there's a number of different features that, that are, are important, uh, in, in understanding whether something is, is clinically valid or, or not. Uh, mechanism, um, plausibility, um, li linkage with with clinical evidence are are all among the the factors that that are are important. In in some cases, with with large uh, uh, omic kinds of of databases and and biomarkers, it's it's not really um, there's there's not a, a mechanistic hypothesis. You're just making a statistical association. A um, certain number of 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 analytes go up, a certain number go go down, and it's associated with with a change. It's a higher bar to 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 get there without that mechanistic association, but it's perfectly reasonable to 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 do that. And the same goes for non-coding RNAs. In in some cases, the the mechanistic association is a little bit vague, but if if there is a solid statistical basis for a clinical association with an outcome of, of interest, then there's no reason, there's no reason to ignore that kind of information. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, and um, last question here. I, I know I, I missed quite a few. Um, would it be all right for us to share your email uh, for people oh, sure. to Absolutely. get in touch if they had questions? Yep. Okay, so we'll we'll make that available in an email uh, to, to everyone afterwards. but. I guess to, to bring everything together, uh, we have a question about understanding unmet needs or market opportunities in biomarkers. And I guess I'll I'll rephrase it slightly just to think to to ask how you think about where there are needs for biomarkers and how how to sort of visualize a, a path towards identifying new useful biomarkers. Yeah. So so that's that's a terrific question. It, it's it's similar to identifying medical need in therapeutic development. So what where there's what where there's so I would say there's there's a biomarker need where there's a measurement problem. And the um and and what where do those measurement problems come for, from? It comes from um understanding what what clinical practice uh, and drug development practice is is uh where it's going. And uh, un understanding wh where the gaps are, basically. So we we've talked about a couple of them. Uh, the uh, the Alzheimer's uh, um, uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, neurologic diseases in general have large biomarker needs because uh, of the imperfection of of measuring um, th those diseases. The um, um, measuring functional status. Uh, across different diseases, but particularly in cancer, is is a big measurement problem, and that's something that 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 we're pursuing. I hope that helps as an answer. It's a little vague. Yeah, no, that I think that's great. 
All right. Um, so we've reached the end of the session. Um, I did mean to quickly share uh, our information for uh, next week's session or next time's section. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wagner, so much for for joining us with, in this. I think I could I could speak for all of us when I say that this has been incredibly informative. I've personally taken a lot away uh, that I'll I'll definitely consider it in my my future endeavors. Terrific. Um, so we thank you. appreciate your time. Um, oh, I am showing the wrong display. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, and with that, I'll quickly mention our our next speaker. Uh, which will be uh, on April 5th, uh, 2023. This session will be focused on interactions with regulatory agencies and will be led by uh, Dr. Uh, Mwango uh, Kashoki, uh, who is SVP of global and, and global head of regulatory strategy at Prexel, uh, which is a clinical research organization. Uh, so if you're interested in that topic, please uh, scan the QR code below uh, to RSVP and there'll be more information sent about that. Um, so thank you for your attendance. Thank you again, Dr. Wagner, for your time. Um, and hopefully see you next time. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone.